The Federal Judicial Center presents Supreme Court 1998-99, The Term and Review, an FJTN program for judges, staff attorneys, and law clerks. Now from the television studios of the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C., your moderator, Russell Wheeler. Welcome back to the Federal Judicial Center's review of the 1998-99 Supreme Court term. In this second part of our program, we'll discuss this term's criminal law and procedure cases. Fifteen decisions, plus the other part of the media ride-along case we discussed earlier. This part of our review will last about 40 minutes. We'll begin with a discussion of five cases in which the court resolved issues involving the elements of a criminal statute. With us to discuss these cases are Evan Sen Lee of the University of California, Hastings School of the Law, and Jordan Steiker of the University of Texas School of Law. Jordan, um, I want to take up the case of Jones v. U.S., Nathaniel Jones v. versus the U.S. As you recall, last uh, term in Almendarez Torres, the court dealt with a statute that included a, a listing of uh, prior convictions and said that was a sentencing enhancement, not an element of the offense. Here we had the federal carjacking statute with its three subdivisions, and the court came out uh, somewhat differently. Yeah, the court had a, the statutory question in this case was whether certain provisions of the federal carjacking statute had to be treated as separate elements, as separate offenses, or whether they could be treated as mere sentencing enhancements. And the court looked at these provisions, the in serious injury and death provisions, which increased the maximum mm -hmm. punishment for the offense, and said they had to be treated as separate offenses. Well, what did they say about the precedent from last year, Almendarez Torres? Yeah, the, the court distinguished Almendarez Torres by saying that there's something very distinctive about recidivist prov provisions. They've historically been used as sentencing enhancements, and that they could therefore be used as, uh, as sentencing enhancements. But for everything else, it seems anything that increases the maximum punishment for an offense, uh, for Fifth and Sixth Amendment reasons, might have to be treated as a separate offense. So the court acknowledged there could be a different view of this thing. Yeah, well, the statute itself could have been read probably in either, either way, and the court said there wasn't an unambiguous answer onto the statutory question, but they clearly wanted to avoid the constitutional questions, so they construed it to avoid them. Although they did, they did in the part three of Justice Souter's opinion, inevitably get into that. Let's hold that discussion until we get into Fifth and Sixth Amendment cases a little later in the program. Um, uh, Evan, another case came out of the same statute, a different right. provision, one added later, this intent element. Uh, mm -hmm causing in carjacking death or serious bodily injury. How did that come out? Right. Well, that is exactly what the carjacking statute requires, is intent to commit, uh, intent to kill or to cause serious bodily injury. And the question there is whether that intent has to be unconditional or whether it can be conditioned on a contingency like, well, it's necessary to use the violence in order to get control of the vehicle. What happened in this case was that uh, the accomplice testified that the plan was not to use the guns unless the driver gave them a hard time. And the district court instructed the jury that that intent, conditional as it was, w uh, satisfied the specific intent requirement of this statute. And the Supreme Court uh, agreed with that. Uh, so the bottom line here is that if specific in th that the specific intent requirement of this statute is met even if the intent is conditioned on something like we need to use it in order to get the car. I got you. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, Jordan, Nieder versus United States. This grew out of a white-collar prosecution of a, a tax fraud, and the trial judge uh, refused, uh, did not uh, include in his instruction materiality as an element of uh, bank uh, fraud, wire fraud, or mail fraud. The court had to sort all that out. How did it do it? Well, the court basically, this was, seemed like an easy question for the court. They unanimously said that there is a materiality requirement in the bank fraud, mail fraud, and wire fraud statutes. And the court did this by saying, that, that the term defraud had an accumulated meaning that Congress presumes, pr is presumed to be aware of, and that that accumulated meaning of defraud included a requirement of materiality. And in this case, they had no difficulty saying that the omission of millions of dollars on a tax return uh, was material. How significant is it that the court reached this conclusion through application of harmless error analysis? Yeah, I think this was probably the most significant aspect of the case. One of the questions was, is an omission on an element of an offense in a jury instruction amenable to harmless error analysis? And the court said yes. The court said this is not the kind of structural error that automatically requires reversal. Well, that's really an intriguing point the, about structural error because the court in this case lists six kinds of structural errors, uh, for example, the complete denial of trial counsel. And what I'm wondering is, 
Does that exhaust the field, those six types, or are there more? It's a good question. I think that uh, the fact that they refused to apply harmless error analysis, or that they did apply harmless error analysis here, suggests that they're moving towards an exhaustive de yeah. uh, definition of harmless error analysis. Uh, uh, the dissent was very vehement, Scalia was very vehement in arguing that if you, if you omit to instruct an element of offense, that has to be structural error, and the court said no. We'll see how it develops. Another jury instruction case, um, Evan, uh, involving jury instructions is Richardson v. U.S. This was yep. an interpretation of the continuing criminal enterprise statute and what the jury has to find. This was a prosecution right. of Chicago uh, street gangs. Well, um, as you know, under uh, 848A, there has to be a series of violations in order for it to be a continuing uh, criminal enterprise. And the question is, what happens when the jury unanimously finds uh, that the defendant has engaged in a series of violations, but the jury is not unanimous on which violations make up uh, the series. And let me just give you an illustration. Let's say that uh, a defendant is charged with 10 violations of the drug laws. Um, and then let's say that it takes three violations to make up a series. The Supreme Court's actually never said how many, but let's assume three. Now, in my hypothetical, let's further say that nine jurors find violations one, two, and three, that the defendant has committed those violations. The remaining three jurors find that the defendant has committed violations one, two, and four. Question, is that a unanimous jury verdict? And the Supreme Court in this case held, no, that is not, that, that, the, that the jury has to unanimously agree on which violations make up the series. They can't cobble together no mixing and matching of, of the violations, yeah. Does this approach apply to every element in 848A? No. The court was very clear to say that the individual violations approach only applies in, in bringing together the series, that once the series is established, that then the jury is free to regard the series as a whole for any further requirements of the statute. Get the series in place first. Right. Uh, Evan, last uh, term we had a case that the special, go out of a special prosecutor yes. case. We had another one, Secretary Espy's investigation by Mr. Smaltz. This was a prosecution not of Espy, but of, of, of a trade group that had given about $6,000 to former Agriculture Secretary Espy. Uh, Justice Scalia's opinion, it seems to me, goes, is rather exhaustive in how it treats these statutes. Right. Uh, well, the issue here was whether the government uh, had to prove a specific relationship or a nexus, or you might even call it a traceability, uh, between the gratuity, we're talking about the illegal gratuity statute here, right. and um, a specific official act. Um, the district judge here had instructed the jury that it wasn't necessary for the government to prove anything like that. In fact, the district judge instructed the jury that even if, um, the, even if they found nothing more than that the defendant gave the gift in respect of the defendant's official position, the mere fact that he was a cabinet officer, that was enough. The Supreme Court held that that was an incorrect instruction and found that there did need to be a specific nexus between the gratuity and an official act. That sort of inspires the question, what's the difference now between the bribery statute and the illegal gratuity right. statute? Well, Justice Scalia explained that in the opinion. He said bribery requires a true quid pro quo, the illegal gratuity statute doesn't, so that in order to prove bribery, you have to show that the defendant hoped to influence a future act, whereas uh, the illegal gratuity statute is violated even if it's a reward for some past act. So if you give a gift for future acts generally, that wouldn't be fall under either statute. Generality is the key, that's right. In interpreting these statutes. Uh -huh. Thanks very much, Evan, and thank you, Jordan. In a moment, we'll uh, return and take up the terms cases under the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure cases. This term, like every term, had its share of Fourth Amendment cases. Tracy Macklin and Catherine Urbania returned to take us through six of them. Uh, Kathy, uh, in part one of the program, you told us why, given the fact that media ride-along violated the First Amendment, the police still had qualified immunity. Tell us now why this media ride-along took place up in Rockville here violated the Fourth Amendment. Well, the Supreme Court in this case unanimously decided that asking the media to come along on um, the execution of an arrest warrant to look for a fugitive in someone's home violated the Fourth Amendment. 
they said that the standard is, is the presence and aid of the execution of the arrest warrant. Now, although having the media present may aid in law enforcement interests, it does, that interest alone does not outweigh the homeowner's interest in privacy. And in this particular case, the homeowners were, um, had a picture taken of them at 6.45 in the morning when they were in their nightgowns and underwear. So they said on the balance, it doesn't, it doesn't outweigh their homeowner's interest. But the Supreme Court did leave open the question of whether other third parties may be present uh, in aid of execution of the warrant. And they also added the comment that police officers may, under the Fourth Amendment, be able to videotape themselves. The, 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 the photographs here never got to the police. No, and they were never published. It would be, be okay to, to bring someone along, for example, to identify evidence in an arrest or something like that. Specifically, the court actually referred to someone who has stolen property may be able to come along in aid of the execution of the warrant. Okay, thanks very much. You told us, uh, Tracy, last uh, last year in this program we should watch for Minnesota v. Carter, and we did, and the case was decided. Another Fourth Amendment case involving a house it seemed fairly fact-specific. Right. Right. Well, what happened there, the question there was whether or not a social guest or a visitor had any standing or expectation of privacy within the home of a third party. Now, speaking for a plurality of the court, Chief Justice Rehnquist ruled that basically because of the commercial nature of the defendant's conduct, the short period of time that they were there, and the lack of any prior connection between the defendant and the third party who owned the apartment, uh, there was not an expectation of privacy in this case. Tracy, what if they would have been social guests? Well, that's a good question, and of course, it's very important for district judges to recognize that Justice Kennedy, who provided the fifth vote for the majority, also agreed with Justice Ginsburg's dissent and the four dissenters that said that, as a general matter, social guests do have an expectation of privacy. Justice Kennedy felt that here, under these facts, there was too fleeting a connection between the defendant and the third party to establish a privacy interest here. However, what a social guest may be like in the future, we don't know from the court's opinion. These are folks bagging drugs very right. momentarily in an apartment. Thanks. Let's go uh, from Holmes, Kathy, to Cars and take up the case from Iowa, Knowles v. Iowa. This is an Iowa state statute that authorized a search after a citation. Well, sure. the court didn't spend too much time with this case. No, it didn't. What was interesting about this case is that, as you said, if the search is coming on the vehicle, uh, they're searching the vehicle right after being the individual being having a citation. Now, typically, we all just get citations, but our vehicles don't get searches. And in this particular case, the Supreme Court struck down the Iowa statute as applied to the facts of this particular case. Why did it do so? Well, it looked at the search incident to arrest doctrine mm -hmm. for the rationale to allow searches. And it said, well, the first reason for the search incident to arrest doctrine is to disarm the suspect because the suspect's going to be in the officer's presence. Well, that, although there is a security interest in police officers at traffic stops, that doesn't outweigh the individual driver's uh, personal security interest under the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court said if the officer does fear for his or her uh, safety, if he has to meet the Terry standards, which are reasonable suspicion to believe the person's armed and dangerous. The second reason under the search incident to an arrest doctrine, the court said the idea of being able to find other evidence is just not present here when we're talking about a traffic offense. You're not going to mm -hmm. find other, any, any other evidence of a traffic offense. Now, the court also said if the police officer, for some reason, weren't satisfied with the identification in this case, then the officer could go ahead and arrest the individual. Um, and the court also added that uh, it thought it would be remote that a police officer would find evidence of another crime. And so on balance of the Fourth Amendment uh, was unreasonable. Thanks. The court looked more favorably on an arrest, though, uh, under a Florida statute, a Florida forfeiture law and uh, seizure of a car. Right. In uh, Florida versus White, the Supreme Court ruled in a case in which state officials had both arrested Mr. White and then at the same time of that arrest seized his car under the state forfeiture law. Now, subsequent to that seizure, they searched the car under an inventory search and found contraband. But the question was whether the seizure with probable cause was constitutional. Now, Justice Thomas, speaking for the majority of the court here, ruled that so long as the police have probable cause, the same type of probable cause that we have in automobile search cases, justifies a seizure. If we have that probable cause, state officers do not need to go after and get a warrant, even though we're dealing with a state forfeiture law, and of course they have the time to get a warrant. Justice Thomas added a paragraph at the end of the opinion also talking about the greater leeway under the court's Fourth Amendment jurisprudence that police have when they conduct a search in public. Could you right. comment on that briefly? Yeah, it, Justice Thomas basically said that this is just like uh, arresting a person on the streets in public. Under the United States versus Watson, a 1976 mm -hmm. decision, the Supreme Court said warrantless arrests with probable cause are fine under the Fourth Amendment. Justice Thomas basically analogized to that same situation here. He said a warrantless seizure of an automobile is fine. Okay, thanks, Tracy.
Uh, Catherine, I said earlier that we take up one per curiam decision. Mm -hmm. This was a case that came to the court, Maryland v. Dyson, from the Maryland Court of Intermediate uh, uh, Appeals, which is the the Intermediate Court in Maryland, the, the Maryland Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, as it were, didn't grant certiorari, but the court did. Yeah. I guess to nip something in the bud? Yes, actually it builds very well off of Tracy's case. It's just another automobile exception case. And what the state court had done in this case is said that courts had to make two findings under the automobile exception. The first finding is probable cause to believe that there's contraband in the car, and a second finding of exigent circumstances. And what the Supreme Court said in that per curiam decision is that courts do not have to make that second finding of exigent circumstances. As long as there's probable cause to believe that there's contraband on the car and the car is mobile, then the officer can go ahead and uh, search the car. Well settled law. Well settled law. Announced in a, in a page and a half per curiam opinion. Thanks very much. Let's take up a little more complicated case. This is an interesting case with an interesting set of facts. Wyoming v. Houghton involving, again, a search of a, of a car and uh, more than that. Will you go ahead? Well, it's a fascinating case because what this involves is when the officer has probable cause to believe that there are drugs in the car, can the officer then go ahead and search the purse in the back seat of the passenger? And the facts of this case the are purse. Yeah, the purse. Yeah, the facts of this case are unusual, and that is the officer stopped, validly stopped the driver, uh, male driver, two female passengers, and what the officer noticed in the driver's uh, pocket was a syringe, a hypodermic needle, and asked the driver, "What's this for?" And he said, "Well, I do drugs." Well, at that moment. <laughs> The officer has probable cause to believe uh, there are drugs in the car. So he orders them out. One of the female passengers identifies herself as Sandra Jane. She's the criminal defendant in this case. The officer then goes into the back seat, sees the purse. He stopped, validly stopped the driver, but now he's looking at the purse, and opens it and says, oh, I see the identification of Sandra Houghton in this case. Well, she then claims ownership of the purse at that mm -hmm. time. And then the officer goes in and looks at the uh, purse again and finds drugs, which is what's at issue in this particular case. So the question before the court is, did the officer have to have a warrant to go into the purse? Did the officer have to have probable cause to believe that there are drugs in the purse? And the court said no. All the officer had to do was to have probable cause to believe that there are drugs in the car and you could go ahead and search the passenger's property. Now, Kathy, did the court draw a bright line rule here? Absolutely. Justice Scalia said without a bright line rule, we would have an absolute bog of litigation. For example, would the court have to look at did she assert ownership or what did the officer know? So it's a bright line rule. The court also did say there's a difference between searching the passenger's property and, and searching the person, which it has the right to personal security under the Fourth Amendment. The old Delee case. Right. So a bright line rule about containers in the car anyway. Correct. Not so much about persons. Well, thanks very much, and thanks to you, Tracy, as well. Uh, we'll be back in a moment for our next set of criminal law cases. Next, we'll turn to a set of six cases involving the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, the right to appeal, and jury instructions. Our panel this time includes Tracy Macklin, Evan Lee, and Jordan Steiker. Uh, Tracy, there was a lot of popular interest in an effort by the City Council of Chicago to control uh, gangs, uh, drug activity by gangs in that city through an ordinance uh, which came to the court in Chicago v. Morales. Now, the court majority didn't agree on a lot, but there was a central holding here, which was? Right. Well, Justice Stevens spoke for a majority of the court, which included five justices, and he found that this ordinance gave too much discretion to police officers. And the reason why was the following, that the ordinance basically said that you could not loiter, or gang members could not loiter with one or more persons, including non-gang members. Uh, for no apparent purpose in public. Now, Justice Stevens found that this gave police officers just too much discretion to decide whether or not a person was out on the street with no apparent purpose. Now, there were a number of concurring and dissenting opinions. In particular, Justice Stevens, I'm sorry, Justice uh, Scalia found that there was no right to loiter, which Justice Stevens had said in a plurality opinion that there was a right to loiter. Justice O'Connor and Kennedy refused to go that far, but they did agree with Stevens that this just gave too much discretion to the police. So that's the holding, that this, right. particular, this particular ordinance, as worded, is, uh, provides too much discretion. That leads me to ask, are, are judges across the country likely to see federal or state challenges to anti-loitering ordinances in their cities? Probably not, because this was a very unique ordinance in the sense that it not only could criminalize gang members and non-gang members, but it just criminalized uh, loitering. Most ordinances dealing with loitering either add some other criminal element to it, like harassment or solicitation of prostitution or some other drug offense. This was a very unique ordinance, so it's not likely that you'll see these types of challenges in the future. 
I suppose the city of Chicago also could clean up this ordinance itself. Absolutely, absolutely. Tracy, let's stay with you and take up the case of Mitchell v. U.S. This was a case that involved a defendant who uh, uh, pleaded guilty at the, at the plea hearing, and uh, the question was whether or not she waived her self-incrimination rights, avoidance of self-incrimination rights, at the sentencing hearing. Right. Another part to this, but let's do that part of it first. Right. Well, the government had argued that the defendant's plea was, in effect, the equivalent of testifying, and so thus she had waived her Fifth Amendment privilege not to incriminate herself at that point. Well, the court didn't like that, and one of the reasons why the court didn't like that was the court said that, look, if this is true, and the government conceded this at the oral argument, that that means that the government could go out and indict somebody, not name the quantity of drugs that they have been involved with, and then force the person to take the stand and then testify as to the amount of drugs. So the court made it clear that no, a plea is not a waiver of one's Fifth Amendment rights for the sentencing phase. Now, the second part of the, the and, and, the, and the, there were four dissenters, but they didn't seem to, to disagree no, much on that part, of it. that part of it. The judge also commented at the sentencing hearing on the defendants, on Mitchell's refusal to, um, to testify. Mm -hmm. And that provoked a certain amount of controversy on the court. Right. Well, there the court basically relied on two opinions, Griffin versus California, as well as Estelle versus Smith. And both those cases dealt with the ability of judges or fact finders to take an adverse inference from a person's silence. Now, the court here in Mitchell said there's no reason to create an exception to those two cases. There were also a couple of sentencing guidelines issues in this case, weren't there, that the court didn't reach? Right. The court did not address the problem of inferring guilt from a person's silence uh -huh. in terms of lack of remorse or in terms of the acceptance of responsibility, which involved downward departures mm -hmm. under the federal sentencing guidelines. We'll get to that in later cases, I presume. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Jordan, we uh, talked earlier about, again, the same case, Nathaniel uh, Jones versus the United States, and you, you told us that the three sub-provisions of the carjacking statute were elements of the offense, but the court almost couldn't avoid getting into a discussion of Fifth and Sixth Amendment implications of how Jones' rights were affected by this. Yeah, the court said that treating these provisions as other than enhancements might specifically run afoul of the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment and the Notice and Jury Trial provisions of the Sixth Amendment. And the court suggested that any fact other than a prior conviction that increases the maximum punishment for an offense might have to be charged in an indictment, submitted to a jury, and proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, was this part of the, the holding or was this dicta? Uh, it, it was clearly dicta. The court didn't, didn't make a, a clear holding on this, but they said the court did suggest that some of its precedents might be read so broadly, and uh, that would have a significant effect not only on Congress's ability to define substantive offenses, but because the Fifth and Sixth Amendment apply against the states in, these regard, in this regard, that this might have a federalism impact, that it may, have, in fact, affect states' abilities to define substantive offenses as opposed to enhancements. And that quite concerned the, def the, uh, the dissenters in this That's case. Right. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Evan, uh, we have a, real quickly, this case of Peguero versus the United States involved federal rule of criminal procedure 32 and a defendant's um, being advised of, of his right to appeal. Right. Th and the question here is, if the district court neglects its duty, is there a per se right to post-conviction relief under 2255, and there had been a circuit conflict on this, but the Supreme Court in this case held that there at least has to be some possibility of prejudice to the petitioner before there can be a right. Now, in this particular case, the defendant had independent knowledge of the right to appeal, so there was no possibility of prejudice. All nine justices agreed that there was no right to relief in that situation. Are there any unanswered questions? Well, sure. Uh, what about the case where the person uh, does not have independent knowledge of the right to appeal? Uh, Justice O'Connor, joined by three other justices, wrote separately to stress that they didn't think the, uh, the petitioner in that situation had to show that the appeal, if it had been taken, would be meritorious. But the five justices in the majority were silent on the question, so lower courts are going to have to grapple with that for a while. And this is a narrow holding about Peguero, who obviously knew that he had the right to appeal yes. and asserted it two years after he was, uh, after he was sentenced. Yep. Now, now, Tracy, Lilly v. Virginia, this is a lot more complicated case. This was the only right to confrontation clause case. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it will go down in the books as a nine to nothing decision, but there's a lot of disagreement about the justices on why the defendant prevailed in this case. Right. Well, all justices agreed that the issue here was whether or not a non-testifying co-defendant's confession, which contained statements against his penal interests, as well as statements that inculp inculpated the defendant, whether that could be admitted into evidence. Now, the court, all nine justices agreed that that issue violated the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment. Justice Stevens' 
writing for a plurality of the court, basically relied on the 1980 case of Ohio versus Roberts, in which it had a two-prong test. And there, the court asked whether this type of hearsay is, one, a firmly rooted exception uh, in the, under the hearsay rule, and second, whether there are particularized guarantees of trustworthiness to justify admitting the hearsay in. Now, under the first prong, Justice Stevens found that the statement against penal interest was not a firmly rooted exception in, in the sense that it did not have the ancient pedigree that a lot of other hearsay exceptions had. And then second, Justice Stevens also found that in, in this situation, admitting this type of statement was similar to admitting the ex parte affidavits that had gone on before under the common law. And so Stevens found that this was too much for the first prong. And then on the second prong of the test, Justice Stevens found that a, 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 co, a co defendant's confession that implicates the defendant is just too unreliable. So under both prongs of Roberts, they, the defendant won, and so thus the confrontation clause was violated. And Justice Stevens made it clear that appellate courts would engage in de novo review on these questions. So that de novo review that makes me think uh, this is uh, this is even though this is largely a case about the hearsay <coughs> exception, it's also of constitutional dimension. Absolutely, Justice yeah. Stevens made it clear that judges are to engage in a federal constitutional inquiry that on this sense. point. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Jordan, we have also the case, our last case into this section of Lewis Jones versus the United States. This was a case, the first case to reach the Supreme Court under the federal death penalty statute, and it really involves two separate, two distinct issues. Let me ask you about the first part of it. That's the jury instruction. Now, now Jones asked the judge to instruct the jury about what would happen at the sentencing hearing if they failed to agree on a sentence. Yeah, the defendant wanted an instruction about the effect of a non-verdict, which in his case meant a life sentence without possibility of parole. Uh, the court rejected this Eighth Amendment argument, saying that there is no heightened reliability requirement that jurors know the effect of a non-verdict. Uh, the court also declined to use its supervisory power over the lower federal courts uh, in this regard, thinking that there are some affirmatively good reasons for encouraging deliberation and not giving individual jurors the knowledge that they can uh, force uh, a, a, a certain sentence. But Jones was also concerned about a uh, uh, charge that the, the uh, instruction itself misled the jury. Well, there was, a, there was some, a particular claim in his case that the particular instructions and forms that were used in the case might have led the jury to believe that there was a sentencing option that wasn't really available, a sentence less than life. Uh, the majority rejected this claim. He, the claim wasn't presented before the instructions went to the jury, so they only applied plain error review, and they found that under that standard, the certainly that the defendant didn't prevail. The dissent disagreed on that point, uh, but the most important thing that the, both the majority and the dissent agreed about mm -hmm. was that in the case of a non-verdict under the new Federal Death Penalty Act, uh, there is no second bite at the apple for the prosecution. The judge will, will sentence the defendant to either a life sentence or any other authorized term. So that, that firm holding comes out of this case. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Jordan. Let me ask you, Tracy. There was also disagreement about the, the aggravating uh, factors here, specifically some non-statutory aggravating factors in the uh, instruction. Well, basically, uh, Justice Thomas, uh, writing for the court here, dealt, had to deal with the question of whether two non-statutory aggravating factors could be submitted and considered by the jury. Now, those two factors basically fell into two categories. One, victim vulnerability evidence, and then second, the more traditional victim impact evidence. Now, a majority of the court found that this evidence going to the jury was harmless error, harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, and that basically ended it for the majority. Now, Justice Thomas, however, went further and basically and responded to the defendant's claim that these that submitting this evidence was uh, vague and overbroad, and Justice Thomas found that the government's argument to the jury made it clear that evidence that was presented dealt with vulnerability and victim impact, which Thomas felt was okay. If Justice, if Justice Thomas's view prevails here, he wasn't writing for the court in this area, but if Justice Thomas' view prevails, that's going to insulate the federal statute from a lot of the Godfrey and Maynard challenges that have been plaguing the states. We'll just have to watch for that. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Evan. Uh, if I can inject a note, uh, federal judges, of course, have been seeing an increasing number of federal death penalty cases in recent years, and they can expect to see more of them. To assist federal judges with these cases, the Judicial Center has Back issues of our Chambers to Chambers newsletter on death penalty litigation, audio and video tapes from center seminars, and an extensive collection of jury instructions, orders, and other materials developed by judges who have handled these cases. Judges or their staffs can call 202-502-4153.
Now, I should add, just to be clear, our release of these documents, the jury instructions, for example, does not signify our stamp of approval. You'll want to investigate their viability under the current state of the law in your circuit. Uh, later this year, we'll be publishing the first volume of a two-volume set on managing death penalty litigation, and the first volume will deal with federal prosecutions. That concludes our review of the 1998-99 terms criminal law cases most relevant to the work of the federal courts. We'll take a five-minute break and then return with part three of our program.